What happens when you put two experts behind mics to match wits on the current state of financial services, the economy, investments, and more? From the American College of Financial Services, this is Wealth Managed. This is Michael Finca. I'm a professor of wealth management at the American College. I'm David Blanchett, uh, head of retirement research for Morningstar and an adjunct professor of wealth management for the American College. We've just been talking about how wise people are when it comes to dealing with an investment event such as the one that we experienced in March 2020. People take a very rational response to a decline <laughs> in stock prices. They see it as a buying opportunity. They can buy stocks far cheaper than they could the month before. They can rebalance their portfolio. That's pretty much what happens in the real world, right? Um, I, you know, I, I hope everyone knows that you're kidding, right? Because, <laughs> you know, in, in reality, you know, it's the exact opposite, right? I mean, you know, I've, I've, I've seen the, 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 the tech bubble burst. I've, we've been through the global financial crisis. We have now the COVID-19 crash. And it, it's funny how every time people kind of repeat themselves, they, they panic. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's interesting because, you know, I'm not used to kind of witnessing how other investment professionals kind of react firsthand, but I'm actually on my church's endowment committee. And um, it was, for me, it was, it was very interesting to see how other kind of investment professionals who you would, you would, you would think would have that reaction. They would say, Hey, this is a great time to get more in stocks, but it was like the exact opposite. They wanted to change the IPS to possibly get more conservative. And I'm like, this is the exact wrong time to do that. So, you know, it, it's funny. It's when it's most attractive to own equities is when no one wants to own them. Right. But I think that's human nature. I think that our brains are programmed when things start getting bad and we start experiencing a loss to want to conserve our resources, to not want to lose any more. And that emotional response is very difficult for human beings to get beyond. Right. You know, I was, I was, I was on a, doing this uh, interview yesterday and we're talking about like, behavioral finance and evolution. And I, I, I think a lot of the things that, that kept us alive 10,000 years ago are the exact same things that make us terrible investors today. Right? That's right. There, there's, there are fewer saber-toothed tigers around today than there were back when we created, back when our brains were actually formed. And, and it's not just all, that part of our brains, the limbic system, we share it with other animals too. So basically whatever was associated with an increased likelihood of surviving to the next generation ended up getting imprinted in that part of our brains. It, it raises the question, like, what do advisors do, right? In theory, you're, you're preconditioning clients when things go wrong to buy more into equities. But, but that just seems so hard to me because you don't know, you know, how deep the crash is going to be, where things go. And, you know, if, if, you, if you tell a client, hey, your portfolio's down, 20% let's buy more stocks and then it goes down more that client might fire you right because you, you're you're not telling the client what they want to hear and so to me it's hard, really hard to reconcile behaviorally how you precondition or just get a client to maybe get more aggressive when the markets are going so crazy deliver financial planning for every person and every need through our chartered financial consultant education program Find the tools and skills you need at theamericancollege.edu slash chfc. Well, let's take a step back and talk a little bit about the history of this idea that markets tend to overreact to recent returns and how that affects stock performance. Uh, we're both big fans of Robert Schiller. Robert Schiller wrote a famous article in 1981 where he showed that stock returns were way more volatile than they should be that actual dividends and corporate earnings don't bounce around very much, but stock prices bounce around a lot and they tend to bounce around in a very predictable way. That when the market is expanding, the stock market tends to go up. When there's a recession or some kind of um, market shock, then people tend to get very risk averse and prices of stocks go down. And if you remember, the whole idea behind modern finance is that you get rewarded for taking risk, but that means that that amount of reward, which is essentially the, the sharp ratio, uh, it's the slope of the capital market line. So the sharp ratio tells you how much of a reward you need to give investors to get them to invest in the stock market. 
And if you look back historically, it does seem that there are these periods where you get rewarded a lot. And then there are these periods where you don't get much of a reward for taking risk. And that is surprisingly predictable. And especially in recent decades, it's gotten even more predictable than it was in the past. And that has some interesting implications. Yeah, I mean, it, it says that, that, you know, in, increasingly investors are doing the opposite. And I think that there's a variety of reasons for that. And, you know, I just think back to my own recent experience with this. And I don't know what I could have done or said to make the committee take on more risk. I, I just, you know, I, I, I did it myself. I, I, I increased the risk in my portfolio dramatically. But that's me. And, and I mean, you know, it, it's, maybe it's different when you're a fiduciary and you're managing someone else's money. But it, it, it's making that connection that I think is, is really valuable because you, we do need to get clients to take a more risk when it's more attractive because that's going to help them you know, have higher returns more over time. So, David, you're, you're an efficient investing robot, and uh, <laughs> most people aren't. They're not Vulcans. So if you were an efficient investing robot, you would, in fact, not follow your investment policy statement. You would overweight stocks when the reward for taking risk was greater and you would underweight stocks when the reward for taking risk is less so you actually should pay attention to stock valuations and do the exact opposite of what other emotional human beings want to do right but you know i think one issue right is that what is, what is the saying that, that that markets can remain irrational longer than like you can remain solvent and so i think i think that's the issue is that is that we want to make we want to make changes to portfolios, but we also, you know, it's when you make these kind of tactical shifts, I think that the, the costs of being wrong increase significantly, right? If you're, if you're sticking to a, a 60, 40 portfolio, the markets go down, that's not your fault. But if you, if you increase risk into a bear market, like I think that there's, there's like exponentially more risk in terms of getting fired or clients overreacting, making bad choices. If you do that, unless, you know, they're not completely preconditioned to that happening. So there's just not very many Vulcans in the market. Like even yeah. institutional portfolio managers, if they followed this type of a strategy where they actually invested more in stocks during a recession, then they could get a higher rate of return on the behalf of their constituents, but they would get fired because, right. you know, if you think about what happened in 2008, they would have been loading up on stocks as stocks continued to fall. And what kind of an institution is going to be able to handle that kind of a loss? I mean, there's no guarantee that it's going to pay off in the future. So you want to, you want to minimize the potential downside. And because of that, I think asset managers are naturally going to be conservative, which is why you continue to get rewarded for taking risk when nobody else wants to. Well, and I mean, to your point, Historically, it, it, it would have always paid off to buy into the, the downturn. The question is how long you maintain that position, right? So I think one concern that I would have for any investor is you, you convince them to buy in and the markets keep going down and the investor just says, I've had enough, I'm going to get out. And that's like the exact long time to do it. You have to have that kind of fortitude to kind of stick with it for five or 10 years. And I just, I just don't think that most investors have that kind of patience. But that also gets down to this idea that we invest in stocks because we expect to get some sort of a premium for it. So the whole reason we're taking risk is so that we can get the bonus. But if we continually sell out when prices are low and buy more risk when prices are high, we're not getting much of a premium. In fact, we may get no premium. In fact, there was a recent study on older investors that showed that those over, I think, the age of 70, they pretty much lost their entire equity risk premium because they traded in and out of stocks at the wrong times. They were more emotionally trading as opposed to rationally trading. Right. And they're supposed to be like the smartest investors, right? They've been doing it for 20 or 30 or 40 years. They should be the, the Vulcans, right? Get best in class preparation for your exam with our CFP certification education program. Start your journey toward this valued designation at the americancollege.edu slash CFP. Yeah, I guess it all comes down to whether you can be a Vulcan, because if you are a Vulcan, you can get a big advantage. If you can invest more in stocks when nobody else wants to, there is undoubtedly a benefit from doing it. It's just whether or not you're in a position to be a Vulcan and how long you can continue to withstand the downside before 
you lose your nerve. I think that's part of it, right? Because if it's my portfolio, I, I can stick with it for a long time. But if I'm on this committee and I'm saying, hey, guys, we should take more risk in stocks, you know, if that's wrong, every meeting, they're going to remind me that that was a terrible choice. Right. You're going to get excommunicated. Right. Everyone's so going to be like, David's a terrible investor. Never listen to him again. And so, you know, I, I, I get it. To me, we just need to figure out a way to kind of move beyond that. I don't know, I don't know what it is, but there has to be some kind of mechanism, behavior. I don't, know, I, don't, I don't know how to do it. But I think that's going to be an important part to helping investors kind of achieve longer term investing success. You know, there was this great study that I saw recently at Morningstar on actual investor performance in different types of fund categories. And what it showed was that target date fund investors actually don't underperform the market at all. I think really the answer is automation, that if you just take emotions out of it, you can get, you can capture more of that equity risk premium than you otherwise would be able to. And when you experience a downturn, you don't feel as emotionally responsible for the loss. Right. I mean, and, and so the reason that people in targeted funds or balanced funds do better is because they just never trade, right? If people are doing it themselves or self-directing, they trade more often than they make poor choices. And so I think the key to your point is it's, it's delegation, but then also like sticking with the delegation. I mean, I think that the, the, the TDFs, you know, they're not perfect, but they're simple. You know, to what extent when advisors tell stories about alpha and excess returns, whatever else, are they conditioning clients to have that expectation where when things go wrong, the, the advisor's liable, the, you know, they, they need to kind of trade more to kind of make things back. So as an advisor, do whatever you can to instill the Vulcan philosophy. Right. Uh, and don't, don't say that your value proposition is active portfolio management because then you're going to be responsible when your client freaks out. Be the Vulcan. Be the Vulcan. And on that note, thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Michael Finca. And I'm David Blanchett. And we hope you join us on another podcast. For more episodes and shows, visit theamericancollege.edu slash podcasts. Wealth Managed is a production of the American College of Financial Services.